The scripture reading for today is from Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. We're looking in the book of Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, if you'd like to read along with me. No, I'm sorry, it's chapter 7 and verse 13. I was, I was very confused there. <laughs> chapter 7, so turn over a page or two. Jesus is speaking here in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's on me. <laughs> well, I just want to take a moment and just thank everyone. Um, seriously, from the bottom of our heart, this internship has been a benefit to Pearl and I in ways that you just can't imagine. We have enjoyed getting to know you, enjoyed working with you. Uh, thank you for being a part of helping us grow in our schooling, in uh, what we're wanting to do, which I'm hoping to be a pulpit minister and to just go out and share the gospel. And thank you for these six weeks that we've had an opportunity to share with you. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for that. Amen. Well, how many of you loved it when uh, you'd go into class and it was a true false test? I would just celebrate. I would just, yes. I have a 50-50 chance of getting this answer right. And then I read the question and think, did we even cover any of this in class? But that's, that's another story. But I love true-false tests because there's, there's only one right answer. Uh, multiple choice, you're like, oh kind of getting excited for those, but nope, there's too many choices. Well, we're kind of wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount uh, this week, and then next week will be uh, the final look at the Sermon on the Mount. And as Jesus wraps up this sermon, he kind of does so in, in, in a true and false situation. He gives us some choices that we have to make. And there's only two choices of each one of these. There's a true way and a false way. And the stakes are a lot higher than in school. It's not just for a grade. These stakes have eternal consequences. And so we want to pay attention to these uh, two choices. The purpose today of this lesson is to look at these choices that Jesus puts in front of us so that we can make certain, each one of us, that we are following after truth and rejecting what is false. That's the purpose of these three things that we're going to look at today. So as the teachers used to say, get your pencils ready and check your answers because that's what we're ready to do this morning. We're going to be in Matthew 7, not 5, but it was 7. So uh, we're going to look at this first two choices that Jesus puts in front of us. Verses 13 and 14 of Matthew chapter 7. If you want to follow along or it will be on the screen as well. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. He says there's two choices. There's a way that is easy, spacious. The gate is wide. You don't even know you went through a gate. It's so wide. There's no limits. There's no curbs. You don't have to leave anything behind as you enter into this wide way. It doesn't require any effort to stay on the wide way. You don't have to go home each night and diligently study. How can I stay on this wide way? It just happens pretty easily. No one has to tell you to get on it. You just follow everyone else. I don't know how many of you have ever been to a, a concert or a sporting event when it lets out and you're in this mass of humanity that is exiting a, a facility and you could just turn your brain off because you just follow the crowd. And next thing you know, you find you're on the wrong side of the stadium or in the wrong bus. 
Pearl and I were in Liverpool, England. We went to a soccer match there, followed the mass of people, ended up on a bus. We were like, surely it'll take us to the right place. Wrong end of town, and the bus driver turns around. There's nobody else on the bus. He says, were you going somewhere else? And we told him where we were going. He says, that's on the far end of the city, but he still took care of us. But that's what happens on this easy way. You just go with the flow, and wherever they go, you go with them. It's easy. Now you contrast that with the gate, the gate that Jesus says we are to enter. He says that gate is not easy. It's narrow. There are things you have to leave behind at that gate. In fact, you leave everything behind at that gate in order to enter it. And it's hard. The question, as I was thinking about being in that mass of humanity leaving a sports venue... Many times I wouldn't even know that I missed my gate. So how are we going to know where it is? How are we going to even know how to get in the gate? Because think about a gate, and there's plenty of gates in this area where you see you have to have permission to enter into a certain area through a gate, and you have to know how to get in that gate. So first of all, how do we know what the gate is? How will we recognize the gate? In John 10 and verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. Jesus is the gate. He says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and find pasture, as we sang about this morning. Jesus is the gate. In John 10, 46, he says, I, 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. He is the way. He is the gate. So the fact that we need to recognize that Jesus is the gate is point number one. But point number two, how do we get into the gate once I have found that Jesus is the gate, how do I enter into Him? There's a number of scriptures we could look at, but I just want you to think about this. Galatians 3.27. When Paul is reminding the Galatians of their status in Christ, he says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So baptism is how we enter into that narrow gate. And Jesus is is the gate. That's where our walk on this narrow road begins. But that isn't where it ends. That's just where it begins. But here's the, here's the driving question. Why would I choose the hard way when the easy way is so easy? And that's what we need to recognize here. These two roads do not have the same destination. If we miss that point, we miss the reason we're even on the narrow road or why we're rejecting the wide road. They do not have the same destination. Here's the point we can't miss. The broad, easy way is a path to destruction, Jesus says, to death. It is a suicide road. There is no life at the end of that road. And while it may be enticing and why it might, it might look like the road you want to be on, to choose that road is to choose death. And we've got to recognize that. Because Satan is going to entice you with everything he's got to get on that wide road. But if you recognize what is at the end of it, it'll make a difference in why you don't choose that road. The narrow way? The hard way? Well, what is its destination? Life. Eternal life. Eternal fellowship with God. The wide road leads away from God. There is no God at the end of the wide road. At the end of the narrow road is eternal fellowship with God. Eternal life. What a destination. And there's going to be times we get discouraged and forget about the destination. There's going to be times that all we see is how hard the road is today. We've got to always remember the destination. We've got to remember what we left behind at the gate. The sin that kept us separated from God was left at that gate as we entered into Christ. What a beautiful picture that is in itself. Yes, it's a hard road. It's not an easy road. But if you remember the destination, you see it's all worth it. Think about a caterpillar, a very basic illustration, but caterpillar is pretty content just eating leaves and living in the dirt. It's a hard transformation to go into that cocoon and to transform into something else. But once you see the destination, 
The butterfly that just brings awe when you see them fly in front of you, and we all do it. We all see when they fly in front, we all go, oh, because they're just, they're gorgeous. It was worth it. The destination was worth it. Don't lose sight of the destination. And encourage one another on this narrow road. Don't you know Jesus, he understands that we feel like we're the only ones on it because he tells us few are on this road. And sometimes we look around and we feel like we may be the only ones on that road. But as we heard, as AJ read this morning, there's a great multitude awaiting us. There's a great multitude that have been on this road, that have reached that destination, and we should encourage one another with the fact that we are on the right road. When Jesus says, few are those that are on this road and few find it, He's actually encouraging us to say, you found the right road, stay on it, it's worth it. We've got to recognize the worth, the value of this narrow road. So take a look at your walk. Take a look at the road that you're on this morning. Are you following the crowds? Which is easy. It's enticing. But it's headed for destruction. Or have you entered through the narrow gate and are on that narrow road that leads to life? Take a look at your life. Evaluate where you're at and make changes. Because today is the day of salvation. It's not too late. You may have wandered off the road. You can come back on the road. See the final destination. He then moves on to another true-false situation in verses 15 through 20. He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So he talks about two prophets. Now a prophet is a spokesperson for God. Some might always think that it's someone that prophesies about something in the future. That's not always the case. Many times a prophet was just simply a spokesperson for God. And he says there's going to come people that are saying they're speaking for God, but they're not. They're false. He says they're like wolves in sheep's clothing. They're disguised. You don't look out over the sheep and immediately recognize them because they are trying to change their appearance so that they appear to be a sheep. But actually they are trying to destroy the sheep. That wolf likes to sneak up on the sheep. He says, beware. He wouldn't tell us to beware if this isn't something that happens. And since the, the, the first century, people have been coming in claiming they speak for God but have been speaking something false. So he says you need to be able to recognize when someone comes in and they are a false prophet. Well, how can I recognize them? They're disguised. And so he switches illustration and goes into this illustration of fruit. Now, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, that's a disguise, but a tree cannot disguise itself. It could say it's something else if a tree could talk, but the minute the fruit starts coming out, you realize, well, you said you were a pear tree, but obviously you're an orange tree. Their fruit gives them away. So he says, look at their fruit. You can't expect to get good fruit from a bad tree. So look at the kind of fruit that they're bearing out, and you'll recognize whether they are a true spokesman for God or whether they're a false spokesman. So what is this fruit that we're going to look at? I mean, we're not talking about literal fruit, so what kind of things can I look at in somebody that is saying that they speak for God? What can I see in their life that will help me recognize good fruit and bad fruit? The first thing I think we can look at is their character. Are they living what they're preaching? Does their character show a Christ-like image? Are they living the fruits of the Spirit? Is that the fruit that is coming out of their life? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Is this the character of the person who is claiming to be a prophet of God, a spokesperson of God? That's the first thing we can look at. Just look at the character of the person. 
But the second thing we look at is what they actually are teaching. No matter who stands in a pulpit or stands before a classroom, the first thing we should do when someone is claiming to speak for God is to check out what they're saying. Turn over to Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. In Acts 17, 11, the Bereans listened to what Paul preached to them. And in verse 11 it says, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, comma, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They received what Paul taught them. And they were excited about it. But that isn't where it ended. They went home and checked it out to make sure what he was saying matched what the Scriptures say. We've got to check things out to make sure a, a person that is speaking for God is actually speaking for God by their character, by what they're teaching. But what do we use as a standard? We use Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable, useful, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Scripture is our standard. You know, we can talk all day long about how wide and high this pulpit is. I can ask for your opinion, your opinion, you can ask for my opinion. We can give opinions all day long. But is there a standard by which we can know how tall and wide this pulpit is? It's the tape measure. Measure it up by the tape measure. It'll tell you how tall and wide it is. We have the same standard. Our measurer is the Word of God. Just because somebody comes in with a degree or some type of dynamic ability, that isn't why we listen to a person as being a prophet. We listen to them because they are teaching the Word of God according to the standard. That needs to be our standard. And that's how we separate true from false. And that's what he's encouraging us to do. Look at their fruit. Look at their life. Look at what they're actually teaching. Are they spinning Scripture or are they, are they laying Scripture out and saying, let's lay our lives right alongside the Word of God? And notice at the end of this section, the fruit of a false teacher, no matter how good it might sound, is good for nothing except to be burned. We don't want to be finding ourselves following after the wrong fruit because it's not going to put us on the narrow road. It puts us on the wide road that leads to destruction. This all ties together. Staying on the narrow road is staying with the standard of God and rejecting, being aware of people who would twist the Word of God to suit their own wants and desires. Don't put yourself in that position. Beware and check it out. We shouldn't go around as some type of paranoid person, but when somebody like myself is presenting the Word of God, make sure it's what the Word of God actually says. Make sure it's accurate. He then goes to two disciples. And many would say that this is actually a continuation of the, the, the false prophets, that he's just continuing that thought. And it would be accurate to say that this could lead right into uh, the false prophets, but it also could just be talking about two different types of disciples, true disciples and false disciples. Let's read verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Jesus begins this section with a shocking truth that not everyone who calls Jesus Lord are his disciples. In fact, he says many are going to claim him as Lord that are actually not his disciples. That's a shocking truth in our day and age. The reason? Why aren't they his disciples? They're not doing His will. They're not doing the will of the Father. They're not obedient to the will of the Father. Who are the true disciples? Those that are obedient to the will of the Father. 
You see, it's one thing to say we follow Jesus. And it's an entirely different thing to actually follow through with that. Lip service does not make us a disciple. It's the way we live our life. It's following after God's will. John 8, 31, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in Him, If you abide in My word, you are truly My disciples. Abiding, living in the word of Jesus. Living in the will of God. Not just for a moment, once in a while, once a week, but in every day, every hour, that we abide in that. For us to be true disciples, it needs to be more than lip service. At the center of this, at the very center of this, is our heart. Is our heart tied to Jesus? Jesus gave up His life so that we can have life. And our hearts are connected to Him because of that sacrifice. So what we do and what we say should follow in obedience to Him. That amazing gift of grace that we sang about today. Our lives should want to follow His will. Our lives should wa want to follow what His Word is because of what He did for us. There are some that might say they love Jesus, but their actions do not follow suit. The Pharisees were known for saying the right things, but their lives didn't match up. And Jesus called them hypocrites, called them actors, that they're just acting apart. Their heart was not tied to the teaching. There are others that say, well, Lord, look what I've done for you. I've earned this. And that's what it appears that Jesus is referring to, referring to in this text here, is that they say, look at all these things we did for you. I am earning my way to heaven. And he says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. To be a true disciple is to follow Jesus' commands exclusively. Not just, I'll pick some here and some here and some from this, but to exclusively follow Jesus. To exclusively seek to do the will of God. You see, all three of these are together. If we want to stay on that narrow road, we need to reject false. We need to reject false teaching, false preaching, false anything, and hold to the standard of truth. If we want to be true disciples, we're going to abide in the Word of God. We're going to live out the salvation we've received. It's going to reflect in the way that we walk, in the way we talk, in the way we treat others. That's our true-false test for today. And I hope it's caused you to think, to think, am I following truth or am I following falsehood? I think Jesus makes it very clear there's a seriousness to this. There's no multiple choice answers as the world likes to tell us that all these roads lead to, to God. There's one road and it's a narrow road and it's a hard road and it's a, a narrow gate to enter. Jesus is the way to that narrow road. Are you walking on the narrow way? Have you entered the narrow gate by putting your trust into Jesus, being immersed into Him in baptism, and then rising a new, transformed creation, walking that narrow way, allowing Him to transform you daily? So much of the Sermon on the Mount has been about daily, daily, daily. Not worried about tomorrow, but just take care of seeking first the kingdom today. Allow His Word to transform you into the image of His Son. If not, I pray you'll make changes in your life today that if you have not accepted Jesus today, today is the day of salvation. If you've wandered off that narrow way, that you'll come back to the narrow way and see that that wide, easy road is a road to destruction. Again, it has been a true blessing to be with you, to worship with you, and to hopefully grow with you. May God bless you. Thank you.